The Timberwolves Jimmy Butler got his wish. Adam Silver spared Mark Cuban. Odell Beckham Jr. is down in the dumps. LeBron James is running short on potential teammates. Will Carmelo Anthony follow the company line? Michael Jordan is in our photo of the week. All that and more on What's the 401 Sports coming right up. Welcome to this week's edition of What's the 401 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. And I'm Mike McDonald. Mike, we have so much to talk about, so we're just going to get to it. The NBA season is upon us, and as of this taping, the Jimmy Butler saga continues. Butler is demanding a trade, and he was also... He also said he's not going to show up for trading cap, nor was he present during the Timberwolves media day. Now, owner Timberwolves owner Glenn Taylor had a demand of his own that Jimmy Butler is to be traded sooner than later, preferably before the start of training camp. Now, Jimmy is reportedly asking for a trade to the Brooklyn Nets, the Clippers, and the New York Knicks. However, the Knicks are reportedly not interested in Butler's services. Now, Mike, you are a Knicks fan. News of the reported disinterest by the Knicks for having Jimmy Butler on their team is getting the fans livid. Do you think that the fans should be upset, and are you upset, if the Knicks pass on Jimmy Butler? No, I'm not. I think for the Knicks, they really want to build for the future. And, you know, from their standpoint, look, you can't bring on a guy like Jimmy Butler who's been struggling to play with some younger players, and then you bring him on to the Knicks where they're also filled with a young roster as well. I think you're kind of just asking for trouble. I think what a lot of Knicks fans are thinking here is they're looking at the numbers. They're looking at these fantastic all-star caliber all-star caliber numbers that Jimmy Butler has put up over the course of the last several seasons. But at the same time, I feel like it would not necessarily be a good fit for the Knicks. I think the plan is to build for the future. The Knicks right now are not necessarily a win-now team. And I think by giving some of the pieces that they've sort of picked up over the course of the last several years, I think that that's going to wind up hurting them in the long run. Now, I get it. It is enticing to go after a guy like Butler, bring him in, try to get him signed up, right? And then at the same time, maybe try to make a push for Kyrie Irving when all is said and done. But I just think right now the Knicks should stand pat, and I don't see that they should go make a move for Jimmy Butler. I wholeheartedly agree. And uh, according to Jeff Zilgit of UST, today. The reports of Butler's interest in the Knicks were overstated. So allegedly Butler wants to win sooner rather than later, which would not put the Knicks in contention and which also makes the fact that Brooklyn Nets are on his list a head scratcher. But that might be more for money because the Brooklyn Nets have room to offer a max contract. So I definitely agree with you. I it's, I don't think that the Knicks aren't interested. It's just that it's they're sticking to their philosophy. They have learned from the trade that brought Carmelo Anthony to New York City in exchange for pretty much decimating their future. They want they have a new coach, they have new players, and they want to build a culture. And they feel as though they want to build that culture through the young talent that they have and the draft picks that that they have and maybe will acquire again. And in, in terms of a trade, they, with Porzingis not on the trading block, the Knicks don't have a lot to offer. So their next valuable assets are their, their draft picks, but they want to hold on to them. So they're going to take a calculated risk to see if they can get Jimmy Butler in free agency where they don't have to give up any um, – any uh, of their assets for him. And then also, you know, the, like you mentioned, the fans are salivating over a possible Butler-Irving pairing in New York. However, if Jimmy Butler goes elsewhere, there goes that dream. And then Kyrie Irving has said on record that he hadn't talked to Jimmy Butler about th- those, you know, the, that pairing or what his career is going to look like since 2016. So... Kyrie may not even want to come to New York. We don't know how um, his season with Boston will be this year, and he may actually want to stay with a contender. Yeah. Well, it's going to be interesting, Keisha, to see how it all plays out. And, you know, we stick uh, with the NBA. And, of course, the NBA, they decided not to ban Mark Cuban despite multiple sexual harassment charges that were have arisen within the Mavericks organization. Keisha, Keisha I ask you, did the NBA do the right thing here? Well, there were two factors that um, Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA, pointed to as to why he uh, chose this punishment for Mark Cuban. One, it was determined that Cuban wasn't involved directly in the harassment, and two, Cuban had... uh, 
was very transparent during the investigation process and then after the report was issued or maybe while the report was being compiled that uh, Cuban and the Mavericks instituted uh, sweeping changes rather quickly to prevent this from happening again. But, you know, I was really surprised and I found the punishment to be a little lenient, especially in this, uh, given the extent of the allegations and the duration of this institutionalized behavior. And I just, I, I find it hard to believe that over the course of two decades that Mark Cuban didn't know anything, not even a whisper. I just don't know how it could be this rampant. We're not talking about one or two cases where maybe it was kind of easy maybe to to push it under the rug or there wouldn't be a, a chatter but you know you're talking about 15 women and maybe even more that had issues um and you know the mark um i'm sorry adam silver mentioned cuban's absenteeism which i found a little interesting because if my memory serves me correctly mark cuban was thought of to be one of the more hands-on owners in the NBA. So I don't know how you can be hands on, but then not know uh, that this is happening to you. And, you know, in the era of this Me Too movement, I just thought that, you know, we've seen actors and executives lose their jobs based on allegations alone. And then moving it to back to sports, you have the NCAA. Coaches have lost their jobs over the actions of their players. And I'm not saying that Mark Cuban deserved to be banned or lost his team. But to me, writing a check for a billionaire is, is nothing. $10 million to him, it, it's not a lot. I mean, it's going to go to uh, worthy causes and that they could use the money. But I just don't feel as though the punishment was fits the crime. And just, you know, to, to sum it up, there's really not any amount of money that will ever... Um, equate to what these women experience. I mean, I've I've experienced it firsthand myself, and there's not a not it's it's one of the worst feelings that you can have as a woman and probably as a human being to be the target of sexual harassment. And you know, I just hope that um, in addition to the fines that you know Adam Silver did speak to, uh, I think the board of governors, or he did send out a memo, and in that memo he used language urging not mandating, but strongly recommending that other teams look at their houses and make sure that they have all, you know, their ducks in a row and that they have safeguards against this. It's a $10 million slap on the wrist is the way that I see it. I think that there certainly could have been a harsher penalty. Now, I'm not saying that they should have made Mark Cuban necessarily give up ownership of the team, or I'm not sure what type of suspension or whether you can take away draft picks in a situation like this, but for him to go out and get, now granted, he's giving this money to some good causes, and it is $10 million, but at the same time, I think that there could have definitely been a harsher penalty. Again, I don't know specifically what, but I think that he certainly, not only for Mark Cuban, but the, the Mavericks got off easy here. I think what's interesting with Mark Cuban is, remember, this is now someone who's become sort of this golden boy owner, right? Here's a guy that bought this team. He's the tech guy that became a multimillionaire, became a billionaire, was able to buy the Dallas Mavericks. And ironically, if you look back, back in the early mid-thousands, mid-2000s, he was always in the doghouse with, with, uh, the, with the NBA front office. And he sort of changed that whole dynamic and the way that his relationship is uh, with the owners and with, with other owners and, of course, with the commissioner as well. I'm not saying that that's what necessarily contributed to this sort of easy slap on the wrist that he got, but there's no question that some changes could have been made. And the final thing that I'll, I'll, I'll say is, you know, Sports Illustrated came out with this article um, talking about these allegations, but I think back in February of this year, mm -hmm. in the report that they have, I think that some of this stuff that's been going on has even happened since that February article that was yeah, released wow. in Sports Illustrated. So I think there's certainly some changes that the Mavericks definitely need to make. And of course, Mark Cuban certainly made some mistakes here, but I think he's definitely got off a little bit easy. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think and hope that he's learned his lesson because uh, if something like this happens again, I think even the smallest of infractions or even hint of harassment could open another uh, Pandora's box for him and he won't get off easily. And I, he, there's no way he could. And I don't think Adam, Commis um, Adam Commissioner, <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Adam Silver would allow it. Right. Because he, Adam Silver couldn't take, you know, wouldn't be able to take that public hit in, on his image. Absolutely.
So we're going to move from the hard courts of the NBA and we're going to go to the gridiron of the NFL and we are going to talk about one of our favorite teams and one of our favorite players, at least mine, uh, and that's Odell Beckham Jr. New York Giants wide receiver Odell Beckham Jr. told Kimberly A. Martin of Yahoo Sports that he feels like he can help out much more in the passing game to steer the Giants in the right direction. Mike, do you think that Odell Beckham is being utilized enough or is it the team's one and two start that is causing Beckham to search for answers? Well, first game he was certainly utilized enough in the game against Jacksonville, no question about it, against the toughest defense in the NFL right now. Uh, certainly he played a very good game, and I thought that they gave him enough opportunities throughout that game. And then, of course, game two, I didn't think that they gave him the, looked at him enough um, in that loss where they lost that second game of the season. Uh, but I felt like in week three, the offense was really clicking on all cylinders. And I think a lot of that had to do with the offensive line. If the offensive line is playing well, there's no question that Eli Manning is going to get more and more opportunities to get Odell Beckham Jr. the ball. The guy's a game changer. There's no question about that. And they need him. You know, they certainly need him. But Keisha, what I'll finish with is uh, it's going to be a tricky road for the next month for the Giants. You know, they face the New Orleans Saints. And then they go and they have to play the Carolina Panthers. They back that up on a short week against the Philadelphia Eagles. And then play the, the Atlanta Falcons. Now, these are four teams that wound up <laughs> making the playoffs last season. Three of the last, you know, out of the last four years, I think those three, three of those four teams, with the exception of New Orleans, has won the NFC. Yeah, I think the, the Saints were out last year. Right, think, they, right? yeah, exactly. Uh, well, they lost to Minnesota, yeah. I think, in that crazy last second <laughs> miracle game. Um, but I think for the Giants, this is going to be a tough road ahead, and it's going to be a tough test for Pat Shermer and Odell Beckham. But I think that the biggest question mark they have is the offensive line. If that offensive line, which really started to come around in that win against Houston, if it's starting to play a lot better, then Odell Beckham certainly will be happy. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree with you. I think that his... Odell's frustrations or his sentiment was based on that Dallas game week two where he only had four receptions and 51 yards and I think you know the Giants offense has struggled scoring for the past couple seasons I mean the last time they scored 30 points in a game was January 3rd 2016 that's a lot of football to happen and you can't score 30 points when you have an Odell Beckham Jr. when you have a Sterling Shepard at one point they had Brandon Marshall but he was gone within like the first couple games of the season but when you have Evan Evan Ingram when there's talent that you know it's one of the best receiving cores in the NFL and if you can't score 30 points there's an issue the offensive line really rebounded and played well on the third game against the Houston Texans and there was a shift in the line where Eric Flowers was sidelined and he was benched and that was a, a sigh of relief and probably jubilation for most of us who just really are shaking our heads as to why Eric Flowers has been allowed to start <laughs> <laughs> this long um, but the offensive line is key and you know I think Odell was probably Maybe if you read between the lines, he was talking to Eli because Eli has overthrown him or short thrown him or hasn't seen him wide open. So it's going to be imperative for Eli to be able to notice and fairly quickly because even with the better play from the offensive line, he's not going to have tons of time to just sit and scan for like um, 30 seconds, 10 seconds, whatever. So, you know, Eli's got to make sure that he sees the field, sees it quickly, and get, and delivers the, the ball to him. And with Odell, it doesn't even have to be a pinpoint precise pass. Just throw it somewhere in his area. He's going to get it with those big hands he's got. And then also, you know, it's going to be – up to the offensive coordinator, Mike Shula, to make sure that he is running an offense that's going to get Odell involved. I mean, and it, it doesn't necessarily, I don't think you have to force feed it to him. I think because you have Sterling Shepard and you have Edwin Ingram who present enough of a threat that you can pass the ball so you're not force feeding and, and showing your hand all the time. So, you know, if... The game against the Houston Texans was any indication as how this season's going to go. Odell is going to be happy. Giants fans are going to be happy. We're going to win some games, maybe make a push for the playoffs, and all will be right in New York City. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's time for some quick bites. With Jimmy Butler one foot out of the door, the Minnesota Timberwolves gave his inner team rival Carl Anthony Towns a massive 190 million dollar five-year extension 
Michael Jordan and some members of the Charlotte Hornets helped pack food boxes at the Second Harvest Food Bank to aid storm victims who lived in towns ravaged by Hurricane Florence. Jordan also pledged $2 million to the relief effort. And Tiger's great! Tiger Wood wins! Tiger won the Tour Championship, his first championship in five years. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. I am going to start off this segment by just asking a simple question. Why don't people want to play with LeBron James? Mike? Well, I think there's a few reasons. I mean, you know, one reason is is that, look, LeBron James has made the NBA Finals every season, right, since 2011. And I feel like when you're on a team where it's NBA Finals or bust, it almost takes some of the fun out of playing, right, because you have this high-pressure mentality. So there's no question that, the you know, the pressure is always on when you're playing with LeBron James. The other thing is that LeBron James has never been one to shy away from throwing his teammates and coaches under the bus, right? He's had a history of doing this throughout his whole career, uh, and, and the evidence is... It, it, it's proven. Um, but I think that it's easy to say people don't necessarily like playing with LeBron James. But what about, like, you go ask a guy like Mike Miller, who really resurrected his career by playing with the Miami Heat, where they won those two championships. I guarantee you that if you were to ask him, did you enjoy playing with LeBron James? Of course. The big thing with LeBron James is he makes his teammates better. I think that's the number one reason why he's the top player in the NBA, is because the other four guys that are on the court with him automatically become better players because LeBron can hit them when they're open. LeBron plays such good defense that he's going to find the open man when he makes a steal. He's very good on the fast break, despite the fact that he's getting up there in years. But I think also, you know, LeBron has never wanted to shy away from controversy, so there's always some drama that surrounds him. But I think it's easy to jump on him and say, people don't like LeBron. People don't want to necessarily play with LeBron. But that isn't the case. Remember how excited the Cleveland Cavs were, specifically Kevin Love, when he found out that he was going to be teaming up with LeBron James. Now, I know that kind of played out a little bit differently. They did wind up winning a championship together, but I think it's a mixed bag. I think that there are some players that would not want to play with LeBron. They don't want to be have that scrutiny, but then I think that there are guys that would definitely salivate at the, you know, the idea of, of teaming up with one of the greatest players of all time. LeBron is such a presence. I mean, he, he just, just because of who he is, he's just otherworldly talented, and he is a superstar and a uber superstar if you just want to put it even higher and in a league that is driven by stars what he wants he's going to get people are going to cater to him even magic johnson and company at the lakers they're going to make sure that lebron james is happy we, when they were courting him magic johnson showed up i mean at least i think an hour earlier sir so before he was going to meet LeBron James because he knew it was that important that he didn't miss that opportunity to um, meet with him and talk to him and convince him to join the Lakers. Now, I think that if you are a star and a superstar in your own right, it becomes difficult to play with LeBron because it's, it's not going to be your team. And, you know, there's, there's ego involved. There's my cheese. like, I'm, I'm just as good as you. In theory, why can't I get this? Why can't this be my team? Why am I automatically pushed aside? So I think that's why you have people like Kyrie Irving and maybe Kawhi Leonard, Jimmy Butler, stars and superstars in their own right who don't want to be part of the LeBron James show right? because they're going to be the supporting cast. And when I was reading some you know articles, one thing that somebody said was that in order to play with LeBron James, you have to specialize in something. You have to suppress some parts of your game to fit in with him. And what that does for you long term, who knows? You know, if you don't use it, you lose it, I guess. Well, Kelly Iko, the Houston Rockets beat reporter for The Athletic, reported on Twitter that Carmelo Anthony and P.J. Tucker probably will not be seen on this floor together at the same time this season. According to the tweet, Rockets head coach Mike D'Antoni wants Carmelo on the floor when Tucker is off, and vice versa. He sees them both as fours. So, how is this going to work out? We all know that Carmelo does not want to come off the bench. Keisha, will there be harmony in Houston? Mike, I'm going to start off with a quote. Whatever I have to do to help this team win a championship, that's what's going to be done. 
Who said that? None other than Carmelo Anthony. Now, this is not an indefinite admission that he is willing to come off the bench. However, this is a move from the outright scoff that he gave when he was in Oklahoma City and a reporter mentioned him coming off the bench. He just poo pooed that right off the bat and basically told the reporter, like, you don't even, that's just ridiculous. How dare you even mention it? It's ludicrous. Now, so we, we might be moving in the right direction. However, why is it that we must assume that Carmelo has to come off the bench? I know that he's, you know, it seems like Carmelo is paying for the sins of Oklahoma City. I think that that wasn't the right fit for him, and it showed. He had one of his worst uh, seasons in his entire career. And when I think about him being in New York before he went to OKC for that one year, he was still the Carmelo that we knew. So I I just found it hard to believe that his skills just dropped off that um, that quickly and that drastically. So he is with Houston now. He's with Chris Paul, who's very close to him off the court. He um, spoke with Chris Paul and he spoke to James Harden and, and they play pickup games and there seems to be a real flow and real chemistry. And those two see how he can be effective within the Houston Rockets. Uh, offense, but now it's time for Mike D'Antoni, head coach of the Rockets, to show us what he can do. Which, if it was something that he didn't think that he could do, then Rockets never would have gone after Carmelo Anthony in the offseason. I think that the Rockets have a nice team here. They make, they came so close to getting to the NBA Finals after losing uh, to the Golden State Warriors in seven games last season. Look, I think start or coming off the bench, Carmelo Anthony will have a big impact on this offense this season. There's no question about it. Keisha, you pointed out the lack of production that he had in Oklahoma City last season. We saw that. There's no question. But what do you expect when you're playing with a guy like Russell Westbrook and, of course, Paul George? So, of course, we expected that those numbers were going to decline, in which they certainly did. Not to mention, I kind of looked at Oklahoma City, Was it, even though, yeah, they made the playoffs and everything, but it was almost like it was a season in purgatory for him. He never looked comfortable in that uniform. He never really looked comfortable when he was on the court, necessarily. He got off to a very good start those first 10 games, I think, with OKC. But after, like, you know, a quarter of the season, his numbers started to tail off and he just didn't really seem like he was comfortable and then there was this whole thing was what was his actual role going to be I think here in Houston, Mike D'Antoni has an opportunity to be very creative here. And I think what's ultimately going to wind up happening is they will bring Carmelo off the bench. I think P.J. Tucker, a guy who's one of, if not, you know, he's one of the top five defensive players, top ten defensive players in the NBA. The guy is a force. No question about that. I think you got to keep him in the rotation. But we also got to remember, you know, Injuries could happen. Things that you know that we that we don't expect. At the same time, the Rockets could be in the mix to make some upgrades once the season begins because they realize that they are a contender to go ahead and win the Western Conference. But I think, like you pointed out, Mike D'Antoni, this is really up to him to kind of figure out what's going to be the best fit for this offense and for this team as they try to make a push to unseat the Golden State Warriors in the West. Our photo of the week is a picture of Charlotte Hornets chairman Michael Jordan and scores of other people packing relief boxes for North Carolina storm victims. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. We're in a New York state of mind with our New York sports report, and we are going to talk about our Brooklyn Nets. It was media day across the NBA, and the Brooklyn Nets had their own, and there were a good number of players who really think that they have enough pieces to do significantly better this year than last, playoffs even, while there are some that are a little more cautious and just believing that they'll get more wins without going so far as to say that they would make the playoffs. Mike, are the players right to be cautiously optic or should they be more aggressive in their thinking and their beliefs on how they're going to do this season. No, I think that they're right to be cautious here because, you know, I think the over-under is something like 31 or maybe even 32 wins for the Nets for uh, the wins for the coming up this season. I think they won 27 or 28 games last year. So, And I know that doesn't seem like much improvement, but I think that there's no question in my mind that this team will wind up winning more games than they did last season. I know that people can look at that and say, well, you know, it's not much <laughs> of an improvement, but when your win column is really that depleted and you don't have 
have much. Uh, it's good to pick up on something. I think Kenny Atkinson, he's gotten comfortable here now. I saw him in an interview on the Yes Network about a week or two ago. And the guy just seems like he's very upbeat. I like his energy. I think that the big focus for this team, of course, is going to be defense, right? Because they know that without a doubt that that's one of the things uh, that really has hurt them over the last couple of seasons. They get that first quarter, like sometimes the first five, ten minutes of the game, they're in it, and then all of a sudden everything just seems to fall apart. And then by the end of the first quarter, they're down by 15 points. And I think that those collapses are something that they're really going to try to look to avoid. You can't knock this team's heart. I can't tell you how many net games we've seen over the last several years, a couple of years, and they're in it, right? Even back when Lionel Hollins was coaching, yeah, they were not winning many games, but there were times where they'd be playing tight games against the Cleveland Cavaliers or even when the Knicks were somewhat competitive, and they would keep games close. You mentioned off-air, and I know you might want to speak about it, but Ed Davis, I think, is really someone that people are going to want to keep an eye on this year. This guy is tough-minded, uh, no question about it, and I think the rebounding is something that he's going to lead a big focus on for them. Yeah, and Kenneth Reed, I actually like him too. I think he's going to be a really nice piece for the Brooklyn Nets. And I think that, you know, I think that aiming for more wins than last year is attainable. So. Um, just quick, I have decided that for the remaining quarter of this year, I am going to set goals for myself. I, I've never done it really in a formalized, formalized manner, and I'm going to do it because that is one of the keys for highly successful people, and if it works for them, why not try it? So you set SMART goals, and SMART is an acronym, and the A stands for attainable. And I think that saying that you're going to win more games than last year is attainable. So I looked at um, last year's playoff standings, and the Wizards had the eighth spot. They were the last team to make the playoffs, and they won 43 games. Last year, the Nets won 28, so that's a differential of 15 games. Now, the Nets had an increase of eight games from the year prior to last year. So in order to kind of guess if they can make the playoffs, that means they have to make, they have to double. Now, it may not be impossible, but because it's like, all right, you won eight games last year, why not win eight more? But you've got a lot of new pieces coming in. So I think it might be a little too aggressive to say that you can win 16 games uh, with new pieces. But I definitely, I definitely see more wins for the team. I say about uh, 30, I say 38. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, Keisha, in the Bronx, you know, the Yankees were kicking the door down of the American League wild card, and of course, they knocked it down this past weekend. We're able to, they were able to clinch a playoff spot. Now, it's not guaranteed that they will host that playoff game because the Oakland Athletics are right behind their backs. At the moment of this taping, they trail them by about a game and a half. But with the Yankees, whenever something good happens, something bad happens. Oh and they clinch the playoff <laughs> spot. And then, of course, D.D. Gregorius with the game-winning slide to score the winning run in that game wound up hurting his wrist. He's going to be on the shelf for the next couple of days, but it does look like he will be joining the team before the regular season ends. But it's very dicey for the Yankees right now to see who they're going to wind up starting in that playoff game, which is going to happen against the Oakland Athletics. It's that time of the show. I know you don't like it, and I definitely don't. But don't worry. You can keep up with us until we meet again by following us on Instagram and Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, all at 411 Sports TV. Also, be sure to download and subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcast, Google Play Music, Spotify, and Stitcher. I'm Keisha Wilson. On behalf of Mike McDonald, we'd like to thank you for joining us here at What's the 411 Sports. 